All right, our next speaker is Mark Levinson. He is the president of Me Loves Reef and has a popular YouTube channel by the same name. And his talk today is setting up a saltwater tank the right way. So let's welcome Mark. Thank you. So no pressure at all for you guys. You know, I just, we're just gonna have a nice open discussion. Uh, dealing with setting up a tank. It was funny because when I looked at the schedule, it said it's a novice presentation. I thought, I can totally do that. And then it said it's about equipment. And I thought, hmm, okay. I thought I was talking about setting up a tank. But our tanks do need a lot of equipment. And so when you are looking at this presentation, at these slides I'm about to share, you're going to see lots of eye candy. You're going to see things you've seen before. And hopefully you'll see things that may inspire you for your next build. How many of you are at the point now where you're about to set up a tank? Well, this is the talk for you. <laughs> and my goal in this information is to help you think now before you spend any money at all. So that way, when you do spend the money, you spent it wisely. So here are a couple of my tanks that you may have seen through YouTube. And I'm going to kind of take you down memory lane here for a moment. There's a bunch of eye candy coming up. But I wanted to start off and ask you, you know, what is it that you desire? What what do you want in your own home? You have to decide on the livestock because you want to know if, when you're setting up an aquarium, if it does not match the livestock, it's gonna be a battle from the very first drop of water. So if you want a predator tank, or if you want fish only, or your, your choice is, I really love mantis shrimp, I wanna have a mantis exhibit, you know, you have to tailor the tank for that. What if you said, well, I want jellyfish? Totally different system. I want seahorses or I want an octopus. An octopus is in a box of water that has to be sealed because octopus are so smart they will find a way out. And so you have to set up the perfect environment to keep your animal alive. And as I said in the very last line on this slide, some of these fish live decades. So when you're saying, I really want to start a tank, I kind of have to ask you, are you considering that you may have this pet for 20 years? And see, most people don't think that way. Um, when you were younger, maybe your parents took you to the fair and you won a goldfish and you came home and you put it in a bowl and that was it, right? And then when it died, your parents bought you another one that you didn't know about because they felt bad and they didn't want you to deal with death at an early age. But um, what we're doing is we're getting clownfish and they can live a very long time. The pair of clownfish I got were called True Percula, beautiful markings. Uh, and they um, are not really well known these days. Everyone has Ocellaris. But the true Percula was the beautiful clownfish for me, and that was way back in 1998. And I found out only later that there was a pair that were bred by Martin Moe, who is one of the speakers, and he had raised them from eggs. And at that time, in 2002, when I met him, they were 25 years old, still in captivity, still laying eggs for more clownfish. So... We do care about what we're, we're setting up. And you have to also consider what can you put with another animal. So is it, I like to use the word reef safe. When I buy livestock, I want it to all get along in my tank. Now, logistically, where are you gonna put this tank in your home or in your office? Is it an area that's high traffic? Is it an area where you can get bumped, knocked over, something slam into it? including even a door that swings into the room. Could that door hit the aquarium? These are things you absolutely need to know before you even set up the tank because that box of water could end up being a giant puddle of water if this is a bad plan. And you want to also look at the situation of the flooring. If you're in a rent house, is it a slab foundation or is it pier and beam? Or are you in a mobile home? My first tank was in a mobile home and those are built very lightweight. So how much strength is under the area of the floor where the tank is gonna be? Basically, I say the general rule is 10 pounds per gallon. I know water weighs a little bit less, but we have the stand, the aquarium, the sand, the rock, you know, any kind of filtration you're using, that's all gonna add up in weight. So we can just say a 100 pound tank is around 1,000 pounds. So you could grab four of your closest friends and you could all stand in one spot together and see how the floor feels. And that's one way to test, just to see if there's a lot of bounce to it or if it's pretty stable. But I made a, skim, a, a drawing, I guess you could say. I'm going to show it to you in one second. Uh, first, I want to ask you, what can you handle when it comes to take care of the tank? 
because you, you might say, all I care about is one anemone, two clownfish, and maybe a feather duster. Well, then you don't need a huge tank because clownfish tend to swim a very short distance and re go right back to their home, where if you had a huge tank set up, you'd have the anemone with the clowns, you'd have all this open water and nothing's going on. And you have to clean all the rest of the tank. You can't just ignore it because this is where all the activity is. So what can you handle physically in maintaining that tank? So here I drew a schematic of a floor. And I'm showing you just looking down from above on a room that's uh, 14 feet by 12 feet, just a typical living space, maybe a bedroom. And you can see the floor joists are going across. And then I drew a rectangular box at the top of the screen. Does that arrow show up? Yes. So this is a 55 gallon aquarium, 48 inches long, 12 inches wide, and it is sitting on joists that will completely support it. And you can actually place it on the wall in the strongest spot. Now this other tank is a 60 gallon cube, 24 by 24, and it's basically balancing on top of one joist and it could teeter totter. Another thing to consider is what is on the floor itself. Is it carpet? Is it tile? Is it floating wood floor? Or is it just right on the slab foundation of the house? So when you're setting this up, you need to determine what will work best. And one other thing to keep in mind, if you've never watched anyone install carpet, is they put down something called a tack strip. And they nail that into the concrete or into the floor, and then they hook the carpet on it, and they pull it to stretch out the carpet so it's nice and smooth. And when you put your aquarium stand right near the wall, the back of the stand is sitting on the tack strips, and it tilts the entire tank forward. And if you look at the tank from the side, it's leaning, which means you have to shim it back to where it's standing straight. So you put shims underneath the front of the tank to get it level again. The easiest way to know if a tank is level is put water in it and look at the water line around the trim. And if you can see it's off or it's leaning this way, or if you can take the tank and rock it, that's a problem. So we want to make sure that it's stable. So think about your flooring. Also, are you on the first floor or are you on the second floor? Some people will say, I really like this one tank. I saw it at the store, it was a great deal, and I want to put it on the second floor of my apartment. And number one, your apartment complex may not allow it. Number two, that floor upstairs may not be strong enough. So we want to absolutely make sure that the foundation that this tank is sitting on is something you can trust. Uh, I talk about ventilation and uh, AC conditions because that matters, especially when it comes to this being in a place of business, because a lot of businesses turn off their AC in the nights or on the weekends when no one's working and your tank could just sit there and freeze to death or cook depending on the time of year because it's not stable temperature. Ideally we want our room that the tank is in to be always climate controlled around the clock. And if the tank is huge, we want ventilation. If the tank is small, then you know it's not gonna be nearly as much of a, of a concern. Now, one thing that I highly recommend, no matter what size your tank is, is to start with two circuits instead of just one. And I do not mean there's two outlets in the wall so I can put two strips on that. <laughs> I'm literally talking about circuit breakers. And I would like it if one circuit breaker was GFCI and the other one would be a regular breaker. And the reason for that is because GFCI is there to keep you from dying. That's its job. And so we want it to trip. And so things that would kill you in your aquarium should be plugged into that breaker. But the other breaker, I don't want it to trip because of a nuisance. I want it to only trip when there's a reason. So I like to have a solid breaker for like the return pump that should never ever be off unless you decide to turn it off yourself. So memory lane, I told you this was coming up. So here are just a bunch of different uh, tanks I've had over the years. I've been in this hobby now for 20 years. And I was counting, and I seem to have set up 11 different systems over all these years. So in this upper uh, left corner, this was a uh, seahorse tank that was three gallons. And then this was a 20 gallon angle tank by my front door. This became a sea, uh, sun coral tank. And then this is my frag system right now. It doesn't look like that at all. Uh, this is my old frag system. Here is one of my many refugians I've kept over the years. And this was my 29 gallon. This was a, a very popular tank back in its day. And uh, I built the stand for it myself. I used wood and I sealed the wood so it wouldn't rot. And that stand lasted forever. I kept that 29 gallon going for seven years. So 
you don't always have to upgrade. <laughs> I know a lot of people, they get a tank and then they want the next one and they want the next one and they keep growing larger and larger. And what ends up happening is they are spending a lot of money and they're not really enjoying their tank. So I'm trying to encourage you to set up that tank that you love right now and focus on that tank and try not to be distracted with alternate tanks. Uh, this 29 gallon was 30 inches by 12 by maybe 18 inches tall. And it was a really nice little tank. I actually still miss it. And then this is my 280 gallon tank that most of the YouTube generation right now just does not know. I ran this tank for six years. I grew it all from tiny frags. This ginormous thing over here is a leather coral. And when I got it, I got a piece of meat from a leather coral from a workshop at Macna and brought it home and took a rubber band to put it on a rock and it turned into that giant coral. And when that tank finally leaked after six years, that coral filled a 33 gallon trash can completely. It was massive. And uh, but once the tank leaks, I'm done. Uh, here's a side view of that tank. And then this one over here was my 55 gallon aquarium that I had for a while. Um, a lot of times I bought used tanks and that's part of this presentation as well because when you're trying to set up a system, you might say, well, my budget doesn't allow me to just go crazy and spend all the money. What can I do to save? And you can save by buying used equipment. And there's people that are always having to move or they're getting divorced <laughs> or something's happening in their life to where a tank becomes available for sale. And that is a great way to save about 50% of your money on the upfront cost. But at the same time, you have to ask yourself, well, how long will that item I'm buying last me, the buyer? It's sort of like buying a used car. You know, you really want to know if that car is okay before you go out and, and get it because, you know, you don't want to get ripped off. And then this tank here is probably the most popular tank I have. Uh, everyone talks about this tank, and I have a cute little story. Uh, a few years ago, a guy called me up and he said, hey, Mark, I've got to bring my nephew over to your house. He bought an RODI system from you, and he, I want him to just meet you. And I said, yeah, that's fine. And I opened the front door, and he, his mouth just drops open. And he's like, I know you. And I was like, yeah, my name's Mark. Come on in. And he was like, that's the YouTube guy. And I was like, yeah, so come on in. Here's my tank. And he walked right past my reef to go around the corner. He goes, I know what I'm here for. And he went straight to the anemone cube. And it was hilarious. I, I just loved his reaction. So I'm a coral guy, way more than a fish guy. I love corals because you can't frag a fish. You know? And fish just die for no reason. <laughs> Even when a coral is dying, if any DNA survives, I can grow it again. So I love corals, and I can keep growing them into huge colonies. And if you saw the video I released a year ago, I had this massive four-foot section that we removed as one piece out of my tank. And, you know, I hated to even touch it because it grew completely naturally. But at the same time, everything underneath was dying because it was in the shade. So I had to give it up. And uh, so I had a lot of people come over for a party, and everyone left with corals. And yeah, Keith got some, and I mean, I gave corals to everyone, and uh, people thought I was selling it. They said, oh, you must have made so much money. I was like, no, I gave it all away <laughs> because I just needed space in my tank and I wanted them to enjoy. You know, I even paid for burgers and drinks, and I mean, we had a party. It was a lot of fun. It took all day. It was a lot of work. Okay, so let's get to the meat of the topic here. Equipment choices are very important when it comes to setting up your tank, and you have to ask yourself, what do I want to look at for the next 10 years of my life? Let's just pretend you're gonna be in the hobby for 10 more years, let's just start with that. Did you want a little tiny all-in-one tank, which has a lid that lifts up with the lights embedded and has all the filtration hiding in it? Or do you want a glass box? Or do you want a box that has holes drilled in it called Reef Ready, which means it's ready to drain water down into a sump filtration system beneath, pumps the water back up, do you want it made of glass or do you want it made of acrylic? And I'm an acrylic guy and yet all my tanks in my house are glass. And there's a reason because acrylic scratches so easily that you just would be best off with glass. But there are times when acrylic is the only option or the best option. Um, an acrylic tank is going to be lighter to bring in. So if you're, let's say you want to bring in a large tank, like a 400 gallon tank into your home or into your basement or wherever it's gonna go, your guys can carry it. When it's a glass 400 gallon tank that weighs 1200 pounds, you're gonna need more friends and it's gonna be a lot of work to get that in. Fortunately, once the tank is in place, 
you're good to go. You don't have to think about moving it ever again, and as long as your stand was really well built, it'll stay. Um, if you're doing a smaller tank, like the 29 gallon, or 50 gallon, or 90 gallon, you might say, I'm not gonna do a sump, I don't wanna deal with all that stuff underneath, I wanna hang everything on the back of my aquarium, I just like a filter here, and I like a skimmer there, and I'm gonna put the heater back here, and you can put all that equipment on the back of the tank, but it does get very cluttered very quickly. You run out of space on the back. And it, it's kind of an eyesore. Um, another thing that you want to consider when you're buying a tank is do you want it to be rimless? Or do you want it to have trim? Or do you want it to have what's called Euro bracing, which is like a thick piece of glass that goes on all four sides to really hold the tank together? And I'm a Euro brace guy. I highly recommend it. And I put, uh, I, I'm negative toward rimless tanks all the time. <laughs> And rimless are so pretty. There's a bunch of rimless tanks on display here, and they look fantastic until you get them wet. And once they're wet, you know, you have that water line along the top. And then after a little bit of time, you have the calcium buildup along the top. And you have the split, you know, the spatter, the salt creep, the fingerprints, the drips. It's all up on the top rim that was so sexy when it was empty. So if you love rimless, which is fine, you basically are committing to, I will always clean that top two inches for the rest of my life. And uh, that's kind of a pain. I don't like it. Uh, in the anemone cube you saw right there, I have about one inch of glass I have to clean on a regular basis. Uh, and I also have to take a razor blade to chisel off that calcium deposit that happens along the water line. So yeah, I, I don't really like it. Plus I feel like a tank is stronger when it has the Eurobrace glass siliconed on all four sides to hold all the corners together. And I have lived through tank leaks where the tank just lets go, and they even had Eurobrace. <laughs> I feel that silicone and glass is kind of magical. It works, and then it doesn't, and you know, the, the magic wore off, I don't know. All right. Oh, and finally, um, one of the things I, I also want to include in the list of equipment, of course, is be a controller, and that's why there's a picture of a, an iPad here where I have Apex Fusion. No matter what size tank you have, it would be nice if you had a controller on it. And the biggest benefit, besides it turns things on and off, is that it can notify you when things aren't right. So being told your tank is too hot, being told that a pump is off, those are those notifications that are nice. How about the pH is too high? You know, things that happen that you just don't see by looking at the tank. So if you have equipment set up that is designed to notify you via email or text, that's great. And I watched Devin's talk this morning uh, at the Apex meeting, and he installed a strip of red lights behind his tank, and when there, anything triggers an alarm, the back of his tank is glowing red so that you just see it from across the room, and you're like, oh, let me get my phone and see what's going on, or let me run over there and see what's happening to my tank. And that's really the best thing you can do with a controller is have a way to control or be notified about things. The thing I used my controller for very specifically, and I've been running an aqua controller, that's where I started, was an aqua controller. I think it was in 2004 is when I got my first one. And the first line of programming I put in there was that if my tank gets too hot, turn off the lights on the top of my tank. Because I was running metal halides, and metal halides are really hot light bulbs. And they add heat to the water. So if you turn those off, the temperature should start dropping on the aquarium. And uh, having that type of design set up is, is best. A controller can also turn on a fan to blow on your tank to cool it when it gets too warm. It can enable and disable heaters or chillers. I mean, there's a lot of good reasons to have it. This right here is a picture of, a, well, it's a piece of a sump that I have under my frag system. And then down here is the M1 pump, which you see right here. And that pump there is a smart pump made by Ecotech. And they cost a lot of, a lot of money compared to maybe something off the shelf like a mag pump or a JBO. But I like it because it's connected to a network and it notifies me when it's off. It notifies me if it runs out of water and uh, I can control the speed of throughout the day how much water is being pushed up to the tank. I can actually ramp it up and then bring it down for the night a little bit. And um, there's something, oh, the most important reason I got this pump, I was like, there's something about this pump I wanted to tell you. It's connected to a battery backup. So if the power goes out, that pump keeps running and it is moving all the water through my entire system. Even if everything else is off, I have circulation. And circulation is the absolute most important thing. And I can never emphasize that enough. 
And when people say, well, I've put an air bubbler in my tank, you know, I've got oxygen there. Well, all the water in the rest of the system, if you have a sump, if you have overflow boxes, if you have reactors, skimmers, that's stagnant water not moving indefinitely until power comes back. And then when all that turns on, all that stagnant water flows into your reef. You just spend all these hours trying to keep alive and you send toxicity into the tank. So if you can keep all that water moving, you're way ahead of the game when it comes to avoiding toxicity issues and low oxygen levels. So definitely recommend any kind of pump that you can hook up to a battery backup right out of the box is a great purchase. Now we discussed, or I threw out the idea that you want to know what kind of livestock you want to keep. Then of course you need to know what does that livestock require. For example, if you wanted to have a seahorse tank, you're going to want to keep that tank cooler than you would with a reef tank. Those tanks tend to be around 72 degrees. And if you said, well, I've had a seahorse in the past, it did fine in 79 degrees, you basically are shortening the lifespan of that animal because they don't tolerate the warmer temperature and they're actually more prone to an infection. So we follow the rules of the animal rather than forcing the animal to, the, to our way of, or our, our finger of God, so to speak, is like, you're gonna live in this situation. We can't do that. You know, we have to find out what's best for them so that they can live and be happy and thrive. Stability is always key with any aquarium that you set up. The more that it is exactly the same day in and day out, the better. I had a friend who had a, I think his tank was 115 gallons, and his SPS corals, which are these hard corals you saw pictures of, they weren't growing. They were just stagnant little sticks, and it drove him crazy. And you know, he said, I check my alkalinity, and I check my magnesium, and he checks everything. And then one day I said, give me access to your controller. This is another reason to have a controller. So I logged into his account and I looked at his temperature graph and his temperature was way down at 73 every single night. And then it would rise up to almost 80 degrees for about three or four hours every day. And then it dropped all the way back down again to hit down to 73. And this has been going on for months because I could go back through all the data. I said, why is your tank getting so cold every single night? And he says, I don't know, I mean, it's all on there. And that pump I showed you, that, that uh, Vectra pump, he actually was telling it to slow down to maybe 15% every night. And so the water was barely moving up to the tank and the heaters were down in the sump and the tank was, the temperature was being measured in the top. And so basically all that cold water was happening and there was no real warm water coming until way later in the day when that pump was up to like 65 or 80%. So I said, look, I want you to set your pump to 80% and never touch it again. And he did exactly what I told him. And all his corals started growing. <laughs> He's so happy now. So sometimes it's just the goofiest things you just don't see coming. Um, when it comes to flow in the tank and turnover, flow is going to be the water moving through the display tank. And turnover, we're usually talking about the water going from the sump back to the display. And so if you're dealing with a tank that has no sump, then turnover doesn't matter to you. And you only care about in-tank flow. And typically, we want it to be a minimum of 10 times the size of the tank. So a 100-gallon tank, you want 1,000 gallons an hour moving through it, minimum. And uh, I see people that post pictures of like a really pretty coral, but they don't have enough power heads in the tank. And so detritus lands on the coral and sits there on the coral, and the coral beneath the detritus dies. So the rest of the coral is alive, but there's a patch of death. And they blow it off with a turkey baster, and it's all white. And they said, what happened to my coral? And I said, add more power heads, get some more flow in that tank, keep the coral clean. If you can't add more power heads, then you get to put your hand in the tank with a turkey baster and blow off these corals from time to time to keep them clean. But there's always room for one more power head. <laughs> so make sure you're doing that. Uh, water changes are the simplest, most efficient, most inexpensive solution to almost every problem in your tank. And because you're talking about water and salt. And then it's just a matter of how much water you change. When you're designing a tank for your home, you want to also keep in mind you're going to have barrels of salt water somewhere, you're going to have test kits, you're going to have tubing and pumps. All these things have to be part of your plan. It's not just buying the glass box and coming home with an animal. So I, I'm trying to give you this so you can think about it in advance. If the tank is small enough, you could probably get by with frequent water changes and not have to dose at all. But if you're doing water changes once a month, you may need to dose on a regular basis the two-part solutions, which would be alkalinity and calcium, which we definitely recommend to do daily when you're trying to keep a reef alive. If it's a fish-only system, you're not going to have to worry about that. Uh, one thing that I do want to emphasize is that, you know, if you're measuring pH, you need to use a pH meter rather than a test kit. 
because the pH test kits, they, they're only accurate for the minute you test the water. And pH rises and falls throughout the day. And with it constantly changing, it's very important that you know what the pH is. And I like the American Pinpoint because it uses a nine volt battery, you put the probe in the water and you just set it up near your tank where you can just, every time you look at the tank, you can see the pH. And while I like pH and I care about it, I tell people don't chase it. So if your tank is 7.7 .7 to 7.9 every single day, and you are thinking, I have to be 8.3. So you buy pH buffer. It says 8.3 right on the bottle, and you pour that in. And you're adding it to bring it up to 8.3 on a regular basis. You better be keeping up with your alkalinity measurement, too, because a lot of times people keep adding pH buffer on a regular basis, and the alkalinity raises way too high. And what you want is the perfect alkalinity, perfect calcium, perfect magnesium, perfect temperature, and perfect salinity. And if you keep those five perfect, pH can be anything else. It doesn't matter most of the time. So I tell people don't chase pH. And I have an article about that on my website. Um, of course, we care about the diet that we give our, our livestock. It can be frozen food, pellet food, flake food. Um, it can be live produce that you got from the deli that you sliced and diced into little tiny stuff and put into a food processor and turn into your own mush. Or you can be like me and just buy Rod's food because it's so much easier and I can just break a piece off and melt it and put it in my tank and my fish are happy. I like to do other things that people don't think about putting in their tank, like banana. I love doing that. My fish go bananas for it. And it, it, I'm not joking. They actually do like it. <laughs> I, uh, was, I have a Nassau tang. Her name is Spock. And the reason she's called that is she has Vulcan eyebrows. So I've had her now since 2004. She's been with me for 14 years. And if I am in the living room eating a banana, she gets really mad at me. She's looking through the glass and she's doing this with her fins and she's waving her tail and I'm like, what's going on? And then I see her and she's mad that I didn't share. So I break a piece off and she eats it like crazy. And then the antheists get excited and the clowns get excited and everyone starts eating banana. Now, I'm not telling you go feed banana to your tank every single day. It's an occasional treat. Just like you give a treat to your dog, but you have a regular diet of food. Um, and then uh, the last line on this slide uh, was very important, and that's keeping the environment clean. Keep the tank clean, keep the equipment clean, wipe everything down, because that way you always see something before it becomes a problem. You can catch it early. If you just leave it to become a mess, then you'll end up with a, a, a mess on your hand that's a lot more expensive to fix, because you didn't catch it soon enough. Um, and I skipped over the, the uh, thing about testing your water. Test it weekly. I'm not going to tell you to not buy the API master water test kit, but it's really the basic kit that just kind of gets you out the door of the fish store. And I want you guys to have a test kit for alkalinity, for calcium, for magnesium, for phosphate, for nitrate. And they've got the HANA checkers where you can have a digital readout if you can't see the colors to compare, or you can do the titration tests. And they even have the ability now to ship your water somewhere and they will give you a full report that comes back in the mail or maybe nowadays you just look it up online and it's in, right there on your phone. More corals just to get you excited. Water quality is very important. Um, I've been selling our ODI systems for 15 years and making your own water at home only is the most logical thing you can do. And for those of you that choose not to buy this and would rather just get jugs of water and haul them home and then take empty jugs back to the fish store to refill and keep buying that water, more power to you. I don't want wet jugs in my car. I don't want things sloshing in the back. I don't want to lift those things. They're 50 pounds a piece. I'd much rather have an RODI system bolted to the wall of my home that I turn on. I can measure the quality of the water myself. I know if it's clean and pure. I know if it needs new filters. I know if it needs a new membrane. I have six different videos about RODI systems on my website. You can watch them all. They show you how to fix a piece, to how to set it up, to how to upgrade it, make it even better. But make, water is the basis of your entire aquarium. You couldn't do it without the water. And so having your own pure water at home, easily accessible, any day, doesn't matter if it's a holiday, you can make water. It's not the store's closed, it's two in the morning, I need water now, or I'm about to leave town, I forgot to buy water for a water change. And then of course the second thing you should always have on hand is salt. And I've seen uh, posts where people say, oh, I'm all out of salt. I'm thinking, how is that even possible? <laughs> it's the one thing we need for our tanks. I always have salt. Uh, measuring your water, once you've mixed it yourself, you know, you're going to have a barrel mixing or, or a bucket. I did buckets in the beginning, and I, I wanted to go to something bigger. I started looking at those igloo coolers like the guys have on the back of their truck with a spigot, and I thought, well, that would kind of keep the temperature stable, too, and they got big, round ones, you know, and they come with wheels, 
And then, you know, I'd go to some event somewhere or I'd be in a convenience store and they'd have kind of an igloo looking cooler filled with drinks that had a roller wheels on the bottom. I was like, now that's what I need. I need their display. Give me that Red Bull thing. I'll take that to go. And, you know, of course, you know, didn't happen. But sometimes you'll find really cool stuff at uh, Costco or Sam's. They have these weird type of traveling coolers that can actually work at their food grade and you can mix your salt water in. They have a lid and you mix up your salt water and you measure with a refractometer because that's the best way to know what your salinity is. And then having a nice big temperature um, thermometer to know the temperature of your tank as well as the water in the barrel is really important. When you're doing water changes, you want to match salinity, you want to match temperature, and you want to match pH. That's why I recommended the pH, the pinpoint meter, because you can just go like bloop, and then bloop, okay, they're good, and you can do your water change. Okay. Okay, here's a trick I want to show you guys. Uh, it's real simple. When you're adding sand to your tank, first thing, if you're buying the sand from the fish store, it's already been pre-rinsed. You do not need to rinse it out. And you can just pour it right into the aquarium. Once the aquarium's on the stand, it's in its location, you add your sand, and then lay down some plastic on top of the sand, or put a big like platter or plate or dish, whatever it is you have, on top of the sand, and then you can pour your water on top of that dish or that plate or into this picture as a vase, and it will just tumble over and the sand won't turn into a cloudy mess. If you just pour water into your tank on top of the sand, you end up with this big sandstorm that seems to last for days and days. I will tell you this, the good news is, as soon as you put live rock in the tank, that water will clarify in about 24 hours. So you do have that option too. Um, and here at Mackinac, when these guys are setting up these tanks the day before the event or two days before, they are setting it up with sand. I saw one guy draining his tank. I said, what are you doing? Someone poured water all over the sand and the whole tank's cloudy and we can't clear it. And so they're, they actually drained it to reset it so it looked pretty today. Um, but I've seen where vendors will put double and triple and quadruple socks to catch every micron that of blowing stuff to get the water clear as quickly as possible. But the plastic bag trick works really well. And as the water rises higher and higher, then you can take the bag out and just add more water on top and your tank is full and the water's clear. Um, oh, I mentioned this before, I just want to reiterate it. When you set up the tank and you've got the tank full of water, now you can see if it's level. Of course, you can put a level on top, but you can just see the water line in relation to the rim of the tank or the, the plastic trim. You want to make sure it's completely level, and if it's not, you need to shim the tank up where it belongs. And how many of you have never used a shim in your life? Let's just do that. Wow, you've all used a shim? Okay, I don't have to explain it, that's great. Um, typically, you want to put shims on the front edge of the tank because the tank is very rarely going to fall back toward a wall, but it can fall toward you or it could be pulled toward you, so shimming the front might be wise. If you feel any kind of rocking motion, if you just, this isn't good, you know, you want to make sure it's solid. Rock selection, um, you pick out what looks good in your tank. Uh, rock is not cheap. Uh, if you buy live rock at the fish store, it could be seven, eight dollars a pound. You can buy dry rock uh, at some stores, or you can buy it online. And then you get all these different shapes, and you try to build it into your tank. And the one thing you want to do when you're doing your rock work is make sure that it looks completely natural and not man-made. And that's hard, because we, our brains think, build like a brick. We played with Legos as a kid, little bricks, and we put them on top of each other. And when you're doing your aquascape, your, your, your well, that's the word, aquascape, you want to make sure it looks natural. You want to avoid straight lines. You want to have caves and swim-throughs and holes. And you do need some flat areas to plant some corals on, but the entire tank shouldn't look like one big flat shelf. You know, it's not a bookcase. It's a living biotope. And then it's very important to cycle your tank. Um, people that walk out of a fish store with an aquarium and sand and jugs of water and a box of salt and a fish and a, a clam and a starfish, that's a problem. That should not be happening, okay? We all agree on that. We want to set up that tank and ideally set it all up, make sure everything runs perfectly before you even buy any kind of livestock. Let all the water flow, make sure the power heads work, make sure the lights turn on, make sure that the controller's connected to the internet so you can get your notifications, because I'm trying to talk you into that. Um, you want to make sure everything's perfect, there's no toxins in the water, it's running smoothly, there's no drips, there's no leaks, there's no weird noises, and then you let it cycle. And cycling is to go through the ammonia nitrite nitrate cycle, and what it is is the ammonia converts into nitrite, which then quickly converts into nitrate, 
And now there's enough bacteria in the tank to where the, it can support some livestock. Not a lot, can't go out and buy 50 clownfish now. You put in a little bit of livestock and the bacteria in the tank, let's say there's a million bacteria, you put in your one fish and now you feed your one fish and he eats that food and he's happy and he wiggles his tail and then he poops and that lands in the tank and the bacteria now is 1.1 million bacteria. And as you add another fish, now you're up to 1.3 million bacteria. And you always have the right amount of bacteria for the bio load. And if you put a lot of bio load at once, you may either collapse the bacteria or just can't keep up. It will eventually catch up because life finds a way, but you might go through a lot of trouble. So we want to gradually add livestock, but first let the tank cycle. And there are ways to do it quickly, and there are ways to do it slowly. And I prefer slowly. I like three to four weeks of just letting it idle. And that's why I put in here the daily lighting period. Don't even turn the lights on when it's cycling. Don't turn the lights on. I mean, if you gotta look in your tank for 10 minutes, flip it on for 10 minutes and then turn it off because you know it's idling, okay? It's not ready yet. And then when you start to add your livestock, if it's fish, you only need a couple of hours of light. If it's corals, you're gonna need seven or eight hours of light. It's funny to me that some lighting companies pre-program the light period to be 12 hours or longer. I mean, that's their, their template. I'm like, wow, that is way too long. Because invariably, if you have a lot of light, you're gonna end up with algae growing in your tank. And we don't want that. I also wanna to talk to you about quarantine. And that's another thing that a lot of people don't think of when they buy a tank. They said, okay, I bought a tank. I bought all this stuff. You made me buy everything. Now I want you to buy another tank. <laughs> I want you to have a small quarantine tank somewhere in your home or on your kitchen counter or next to the tank where you can put your new livestock and make sure that it's healthy before you put it into your display tank. And this cube that you're looking at right here was actually a leftover thing I made. It held 14 gallons of water. I gave it a couple pieces of live rock, a heater, a power head, and a little spotlight light bulb. It wasn't even a special light. And it had a little glass thermometer in there, and I just ran it all the time. And any time I came home with a new coral, it went into that quarantine tank. Any time I got a new fish, it went into that tank. And that way, the new fish can be in there. Are we to five minutes already? I think I have too many slides. Um, if the uh, fish is in that box of water by himself, you can feed that fish with no competition. There's no one fighting for the food. He learns what food you're offering. And that way, when you finally put it into your tank with all the other fish that exist, he already knows what it is, he or she, and they will recognize it and eat it, and they won't starve to death. But having a quarantine tank is really good to avoid putting a disease into your tank because if that fish breaks out in anything and you're worried, you're not going to put it into your uh, display. And guess what? You get to get another tank called a hospital tank. <laughs> anyway. Uh, dipping corals is way easier. It takes 10 minutes. You can put them in your tank immediately. So I like to have the quarantine tank even for corals because when I come home with a coral, I'm not ready to put it in my tank immediately. Typically, I've got too much going on in my life, but I need to get it in the water. So I can put it in the, quor in the quarantine tank and let it idle for a couple of days to have time to actually dip and inspect and cut off some algae or whatever. And you want to see beautiful, clean polyps when you study your stuff. i got to talk fast. Uh, budget. I'm going to tell you to set up a tank from scratch with really good gear, not the best, will cost you $47 a gallon. And uh, I did the math on this, I have a whole article. <laughs> because when I was listening to other people, they kept spitting out the phrase, it's $25 a gallon. I said, when did they come up with that number? And so I said, okay, if I bought these lights and that skimmer and this pump and that water and this rock, you know, and I came out, it came out to about $47 a gallon. So a 100-gallon tank is around $4,700 before you buy any livestock. We're just talking about equipment. Um, so obviously, if you want to save money, a smaller tank would be less expensive. And somebody said, this hobby will pay for itself, and that is so not true. They say, oh, yes, you can just sell corals, and you'll make all your money back. You're going to... Mm, don't do it. Join a local club. Like I said to you guys earlier, you can buy used gear. Support your local fish store because they are there when something's going wrong with your tank. You can go up there and do a water test. You can buy a pump on the spot. You can order a light through them. I get we can get stuff online. I have an online business. It sounds crazy. I'm telling you to go to the local fish store. But those are the guys I go to to see the new fish and the new corals that came in, and I shop there. And that's where all the excitement is drawn. The excitement is not from people that are like, let me go to YouTube and learn about the ocean. That's not how it works. We go to public aquariums and we see beautiful livestock and we get very excited. And that's what gets us thinking about, hmm, maybe I could do something small in my living room. And then make yourself a local friend. They could become your tank sitter. Um, and you could be their tank sitter when they travel. 
You must have a cleanup crew. All the tanks that have algae problems, I never see a snail in them. You have to have critters. And on my website, milosreef.com, you gotta just put slash C-U-C, clean up crew. And that'll give you my article with a lot of pictures of critters you could put in your tank that will mow down all the algaes you don't like. And here's some equipment because it said my talk's about equipment. Um, there's a power board there that has a battery backup right here, battery backup, that connects to these two things here that runs that pump there and the other pump that's down in here. And then I have all my electrical stuff here. I have an iPad up here. Over here, I have what are called DJ switches that I barely use. The DJ switches have an on-off switch, so I can plug everything in the back, and I can just flip a switch on to turn something on or off. Great for water change. You're trying to move water from here to there with a pump and tubing, and your hands are wet, and you just bump the switch to on and pump the water in, and when it's done, flip the switch off and not try to rip a cord out of the wall. It's nice to think ahead for those kinds of things. And finally, everything you do for your tank should be daily. You feed your tank daily, you top off your tank daily. You can automate that, by the way. There's ways of doing that where you don't have to think about it. But you should not be watching the water go down, 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 down. It's been four days, like, okay, let me pour some water in. Because your salinity will rise and rise and rise as the water evaporates out of the tank, and that will affect your livestock. And you'll watch your beautiful corals close up in misery until you add that water to dilute the salinity back to normal. So basically, I tell you, if you don't have an automated system, when you feed the tank, you pour in your top off. Do it the same time, same day. Dose your tank if you're trying to keep corals alive because they need it. Clean your glass daily. That's what they do at the fish store. Every day they clean all the tanks. Don't think that you're immune. <laughs> your tank does have to have the glass cleaned. It's important. And then I always tell people, take pictures. It's great to document what's going on with your tank to see things grow over time or change over time or compare. Share them with other people and ask for help. I ask for help. I do. Believe it or not, I, I say, hey, Ask me 100 questions, I don't know what's going on, I cannot see my way through it, and they'll help me find the solution. And keep reading. Coral Magazine is excellent. There's articles on websites like Reefs. Of course, there's a thousand articles on my website. You can Google anything you have a question about and add the word Milev to the end, and Google will find it. Blogs, forums, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, it's all there. And then finally, you must plan for emergencies. So even though I've talked you into buying a tank and buy a quarantine tank and buy all this gear, you need a few extra things for if something goes wrong. You have to have an extra pump on hand. You have to have fresh test kits on hand. You have to have some way to keep the power going, which might be a small generator or a UPS. You want to have those kinds of things. And that is my last slide, and I did it right on time. I have one minute, one question. Look at that. I covered it all. 